We approach the end of the age. A time when all will be revealed. I'm gonna kill you. Welcome to the Zep Report. How are you? Step right on in and find a clue. A greetings. In the name of the Most High, Yeshua, Yahusha, Jesus, the One, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Jah, Ayah, 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 Ayah. The Lord, the Sovereign, the True Sovereign, the Lamb, all praise be to the Lamb. The way, the truth, the life. The light. The light. The sound. The Holy One of Israel. Gosh. Will no one agree? I'll have to catch up on my rest, I think. Coming to you at a, the magic hour of 3.02 a.m. Well, whenever you hear this, for me it's 3.02 a.m. That has always been my creative time. It's also the time of my birth. When I came into the world, helpless, born into a hostile environment for God, to say the least, Nonetheless, nonetheless, I was a child of God and not maybe, not the world. I think everyone knows who's who and what's what at birth even before birth, physical birth that is, in which some people say that we're, in their interpretation, that we're born dead because of the fallen state of humanity. Well, I don't think it's dead necessarily. Uh, More like not completely born. You know, more like in a process. More like a humble beginning. The seed's been planted, it's germinated, but will it flower? will come to fruition. The farmer plants many seeds, but only needs a fraction of them to fully germinate, to fully flower, to fully grow for a harvest. Does not need all of them. Jesus said it himself. Many are called, but few are chosen. 
that a man who is set on the course that puts his shoulder to the plow of his field and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom of God. Likewise, Lot's wife, who looked back lovingly on Sodom, the city, was frozen into a pillar of salt. To me, I envisioned a pillar of salt to be like glass. Glass from, say, a nuclear explosion. Obviously, went against the commandment to go and not look back. But obviously, she disobeyed not believing God. You know, did God say all over again? And the consequences were catastrophic, for her that is. And for all those who look back, once they've gotten the call and well, I'm not saying it's a deal breaker for you. But certainly, when God wants you, and you look back, he tends to smack you around a little bit. And then you go, oh, and repent, and you're, you know, you're back on course, because there's only one path been given to us. There's not two. The world is a default position. It's not a path. It's not a big wide path. I mean, that's just a metaphor. And it works to a certain extent, but that's not what it is. It's likened unto a big wide path, but it's not at all. It's the default position of humanity. In other words, it's no path. It's more akin to spitting in a circle. Uh, it, it means that you know, on a, on, on a spiritual level, it means that you've given up and you're just going to float downstream. You're going to take her easy. You know, you're just going to go ahead and, you know, go along to get along and uh, monkey see, monkey do, and just kind of fit in and off you go. Well, there's other people that don't have that choice. They're never going to fit in. They're never going to be accepted no matter what they do no matter what they say they decide or what they try to do, it will be counted for nothing. It doesn't even matter if all we have are cyber relations. Those relations will behave the same way as in the world. It's just um, that, you know, they are not that intelligent, but they are connected to a hive that makes them especially intelligent in terms of time and space and knowing, you know, being able to intervene up ahead and spook you and scare you and, you know, kind of try to chastise you into obeying. At the end of the day, you may be a misfit, but as long as you're an obeying misfit, they'll put up with you. Meaning, you know, weird stuff won't happen to you. Weird, awful things. But have you noticed now how the world is in such dire straits that they don't have time to really launch an attack on anyone? They're um, beginning to understand that their extinction draweth nigh. Their complete utter annihilation draws very close. Mine, no. Theirs, yes. You would think that by now these geniuses might get their head out of their ass and actually, out of their collective ass, I should say, and, and, and basically, you know, sort of smell the coffee, you know. The doom and gloom is for them. The annihilation is for them. The complete and utter failure of themselves, their families, their children, their elders, uh, all that makes up them uh, is at the door. You would think that instead of playing games and continuing trying to get control of God's children in, in some kind of pissing contest, 
you would think, and of course I'm alluding to witchcraft, you would think, you know, witchcraft meaning control of the entire world, beast system, etc. You would think that they would, you know, somehow have some slight concern for their own lives. And interestingly enough, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it appears to me in many cases that they're so smug in their own lives even now and so arrogant and so above it all that they actually believe they're taken care of. They don't think this snake will bite its tail. They don't think this thing will, 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 will turn back on them. They've been in the system that has taken care of themselves, their parents and grandparents and everybody as far as they can tell since the beginning of time. And they feel if they stay the course, things will just be fantastic. And so the Lord will vex them. And now is the time of vexation. This is not meant for you, lambs. Okay, weirdos and misfits or whatever, you know, not, not yet aware that you're a lamb. Look, it's not meant for you. You are here, as I am here, to witness God's moving. He, it does exist. Um, and the witches all say, well, I've, I'm an atheist as far as God's concerned. And then they move the energy around and do their little rituals. I understand. They're at war with God that they say they don't believe in. They're at war with God by trying to control his children and break them down because they can't control them. So to break them down and to break their spirit and to break them into a million pieces and then do a victory dance, not realizing that just behind them is the um, power so great it can stamp them like a toothpick that is ready to strike at any moment and is picking them off one by one around the world and eventually collectively until there are none left. You know, you can't make this stuff up, right? This is what the Bible says about the conclusion of the matter here. The Lord has said in the Old Testament, it's very misunderstood as, you know, obviously Satanists like Obama like to get up there and say, well, what about in Leviticus here? It says, that, are you going to kill the witches? <laughs> As a way of putting down Christianity, which he does. Um, a to wit, he is no, not a Christian, you know, as you would think. But he also is not a Muslim either. He is simply a Luciferian uh, in the hierarchy. And that's how he is seen by God obviously in rebellion. So he'll use a mosque to put down, you know, and claim to be a Christian at the uh, prayer breakfast and do a sort of a, you know, this mumbo jumbo, you know, uh, Bible quoting thing, you know, to make himself look good. But he doesn't believe it. He just laughs about that when he gets off of there. He has not one shred of Jesus in him, not one shred other than being this prodigal son of some sort. And that's why he does the scriptures so well. Because he's, you know, lying, he's faking it. Just like he fakes his whole, his whole life is a fake. Why would he suddenly be true on one day in one prayer meeting, one day out of the year? Answer, he wouldn't be, if, you know, logic holds sway here, he wouldn't be. Since he's a pathological liar, he would continue to lie. That means he would quote scripture trying to look good. And if Christians are duped and they say, oh, well, this snake is all dressed up, doesn't look like a snake anymore to me, uh, then these people are disgusting, despicable, and should be thrown out of the illusion that they are in the kingdom of God when they are certainly not as most everyone at the prayer breakfast is not and has not anything to do with God whatsoever. In fact, there's no connection between Jesus Christ and that prayer breakfast. None other than just putting on a show, a confidence game. Uh, not even that nice a set of false teeth. 
And of course, no, I don't believe them. I've had my time believing them, but since 501c3 pastors tell me, oh, what's wrong with you, Zeph? Then I realize not only do I not believe them, but I doubly and triply don't believe them now after that kind of talk. I mean, if a 501c3 preacher says it, boy, oh boy, that's the final end all and be all, ain't it? No, when I hear that, then I know to double down on my, my, my true belief, which is true, that they're phoning it in. If there was a pastor worth his salt anywhere in Washington, D.C., anywhere, anywhere, I, well, I don't care what you say, black church, white church, this church, I don't care where, they would be screaming about the Luciferian um, ritual setup of the architecture of Washington, D.C. They would be all over that. Like Reagan with the, with the Berlin Wall, they would go to the, the Satan's penis, the obelisk, and say, tear this thing down. This is a blasphemy. This proves that the United States worships Satan. That's the hidden second tier. Obviously, the reflecting pool is about contacting uh, the, the spiritual world and channeling these so-called gods. Obviously, the Oval Office, feminine, it represents the vagina and the consummation, or if you like, black magic, you know, to create a ritual space to wield power from. If you know what these symbols mean and you know how they're arrayed in a line like that, then you understand and, 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 and how they are cosmically, then you understand exactly what they mean. If you were to come here from Mars or outer space or somewhere, if there were, some, were such a thing, you would come here and just like you would see the Roman Empire and the Colosseum and this and that, you, you know, or the Egyptian uh, uh, you know, hieroglyphs and whatnot, you would come here and you would conclude this nation worships Satan and nothing else. There's no evidence of God, no evidence of Jesus Christ, no evidence of anything like that in Washington, D.C. whatsoever. So what would someone conclude? These monuments are to the devil, and so that's what the nation is all about, right? But of course not. These brain-dead, comatose, zombie pastors in Washington, D.C., no matter where they are, rich, poor, or in between, uh, don't seem to have a clue what's going on. I mean, that's what I would conclude if I were to come here and I've never been on Earth before and I, and I saw, I went to the, to, to the capital of the United States and I were to see these buildings and the various other gargoyles and whatnot and all these little demons and, and, and lifting up Luciferians like Albert Pike and stuff uh, in, in, in statue form, I would simply conclude uh, having Washington in a Baphomet pose and all that uh, wearing a Greek outfit, uh, you know, or a Romanesque uh, um, toga or whatever, I would simply conclude the obvious. It would not take any rocket science, science or anyone to break it down for me. I would simply conclude what has been presented to me rather than making up some story. I would then conclude that a prayer breakfast is nothing but comedy at its worst. And I would then walk on, knowing what I know, which doesn't need to change because it's the truth. That's why it stays consistent. And you can go all the way back to 2002 and it's going to be the same message. Nothing changes when you have the truth. It remains the same. It's only by the grace and power of God it, well, if I were Billy Graham, I would have said something, don't you? Wouldn't you? Don't you think? It, when I came to the Lord, I tried to find a church, and all I found were Satanists. You know what I mean? I, I didn't. I wasn't looking for it. I was just looking to, to, you know, I was just doing what I thought was right. But they had the balls to come over to my home and tell me to take these things off the wall and these masks from Tibet and all these other things I had 
and these paintings. And, and I obeyed. I took it all out in the desert and I just abandoned it all, just like a big junk pile. Now, of course, I wish I hadn't done that. They would look at objects. I mean, I never worshipped any of the Tibetan masks or the Balinese mask or anything. They're just, you know, they're, they're, they say, well, they're demons. And I'm like, well, you know, that's your conclusion. You know, they may have a demonic face to chase away evil, but I mean, that's, you know, call it ignorance or paganism or just art, a folk art, if you like. But I rather, you know, I mean, I did have a big Buddha made from a mango tree. And I also wish I still had that. I don't worship Buddha. And no good Buddhist would ever worship Buddha anyway. Jesus was more of a Buddhist than any Buddhist. And instead of the void, we have the Father. I mean, it's really simple. The Buddhist gets lost because of self-works and no, you know, taking on the onus of the world on his own back. And that might be laudable in some way, but uh, that's where the, um, the detour into ignorance goes, and that, of course, is why Buddhism fails, because it relies on, on personal works of enlightenment, which, of course, could never be, because the, the concept is absurd. You're supposed to say, that concept is absurd, and they'll say, you are enlightened, my son. I mean, whatever. It becomes a circular joke. That's why Buddhists are so pathetic in the end. That's why, you know, the, 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 the very devout, completely frustrated with how the world is and the, the, the fact they can make no impact on it, completely frustrated that their enlightenment means nothing, will set themselves on fire in protest. Uh, to be sure, a sacrifice that is maybe horrific to watch, but is wasted and steeped in the thing the Buddhist does never want to, wants to be. The Buddhist never wants to be thought of as ignorant. However, the Buddhist is ignorant because the Buddhist has taken, at least the ones who are pursuing the, the more pure path, have taken the wrong route, whether it be Zen or Chan or the original Indian Buddhism or the Hinayana path or the Mahayana path. It does not matter. Ignorance is ignorance, and it will always be steeped in ignorance Nice virtues, some nice ethics. You can find ethics like that on the um, inscribed on Satan's dick. So what? You can put scripture quotes on Satan's dick. So what? It's meaningless. Uh, perhaps to someone who has no mind, someone whose eyes are completely closed, someone who has, I mean, you know, I've had to sit here and be assaulted by the likes of this Ted Cruz guy. Sending all these emails in my email box about how he's praying and to bring forth Christ and all this stuff when he's as guilty and as dirty as you can possibly get. He does all this Jesus dance and then he goes out lying and sending up a storm in the name of Jesus and he seems to have no problem, no, his conscience obviously does not kick in. You know, some of the dirtiest stuff I've seen comes from that idiot. Anyone who votes for him is obviously, like he is, steeped in ignorance. I think he actually believes that Jesus is like this genie in a bottle, that he just bring forth Christ and we win the election. You know, I mean, I think he's that far gone or that un enlightened or that you know uh, or that spiritual that, that a man devoid of any holy spirit you know he likes to make a show of his christianity by putting his knees on the concrete ground and praying in front of the cameras and then he goes in his emails and he starts lying and begging for money and just being like the typical shark well what is it mr cruz what's your choice here I'll give you the answer. You know, I can cut to the chase where nobody else can really because I, like the Donald, I have no affiliation. Let me, let, me, let me just lay this on you, Ted. It's not your up to you. And it's not about you. Align yourself with the Lord or don't. 
but you're not going to fool people who know the Lord. Making a show of external Christianity is disgusting to Jesus, to Yahusha, Yeshua, whatever. All these names, I believe, are valid, by the way. When I say Jesus or Yahusha or Yeshua, there are people that say you have to say Yahusha. And, and before they used to say you had to say Yahusha or Yahushua, okay? Or Yeshua, which is the, the, the you know, the, as the Hebrew uses. Um, and they say, well, because the, the, it says call on that name in particular. Well, Yahusha, I have news for you people. Yahusha, Yeshua, and all these, or Jesus, or whatever name you want to use. These are all just simply approximations of something. The Lord knows your heart and knows if, you, if you, you're crying out for him and you don't even know those words. He knows. This sort of, you have to say it a certain way or dance in a certain kind of line or twist around a certain way is all incorrect. The Lord measures the heart. But, but it's okay. You know, I'm not here to fight that fight. So if I say Jesus, if I say Yahusha, Yeshua, Yahuwah for God, or, 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 you know, when I say Yeshua and Yahweh and Yahweh, 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 which is the name that I was given, it's all the same thing, or the Lamb. It's all the same thing, or the King, or the Sovereign. It's all the same thing. The creator of the world, the true light, the creator and the savior, the, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, the water of life, that. I am that I am, Yahweh, the, 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 the I am. And that is my God, but I am also I am. So you see, the mystery continues. I'm not separate from my God, and he is not separate from me. Look up John 17, and if you can decipher that. I think John 17 is more difficult to get through for people than the book of Revelation, which seems to have people stumped continuously. No worries on you, though. I was going to add something to say about the Mark of the Beast. The Mark of the Beast, they're working on a tattoo that, you know, that will take care of. Some people say there'll be uh, an enticement to get this Mark of the Beast. But the, I went back into the book of Revelation, and I realized that the book is actually saying that in order to buy or sell, you have to have this. And that, you know, when, when, when man wanted to die, when they're getting stung by a locust, those not written in the Lamb's Book of Life... Um, they tie it in with the mark of the beast, and that well could be, but it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence. In other words, that the mark of the beast that takes you out of the Lamb's Book of Life makes you susceptible to these stings of these scorpions and you're not able to die because you have some sort of life extension technology in the mark of the beast. I think that's stretching. I think that's speculation there. I think if we keep it to the, to the state of buying and selling and a requirement of the state that you be um, given this little tattoo and they'll say it's innocent just like, you know, you get a little stamp to go in the movie theater or, or rather they do the party or into the show or into the whatever, you know, and they remember you used to put it under a little light and you could see that you had the little stamp and they'll say it's nothing more or less than that and it's uh, because we have a cashless society it's the only way you can really buy or sell. I think if we keep it on that level and realize that that, you know, but, but they say that it's got to be some kind of tampering because the Lamb's Book of Life is about DNA, and, and indeed it is. Um, but I think that tampering perhaps could be, and this is my own speculation, an unwitting change in DNA that people aren't aware of. That's why the pastors have to be very, very keen on cautioning the flocks to, before they go getting chipped 
or even better tattooed because in the in the Hebrew and the and the in the um, Aramaic and and, and uh, in the Greek, uh, when you see this mark, uh, the translation or the approximation of translation uh, is more akin to tattoo because the tattoo goes in the skin, right? Goes in the skin. It's underneath the skin. It's in the skin or in the forehead. Yes. So that a tattoo would be more likely. And so I've been reading lately that there's a company that has made this tattoo. Where it has a tattoo ready to go. And they put it in your, you know, on your wrist or whatever as a means of identification. And it will help you to sail through the airport or make sure you get, instead of going through the TSA thing, you can go right through. Um, you know, the security restrictions will be off of you. Um, you're already vetted, and so you don't have any problem proving that you don't have to worry about getting on a no-fly list or having anything mishandled. You've got, you know, the the ident identification tattoo, and so that's it because it's something that's not subcutaneous, like a chip that could be removed or changed or altered. It's something that cannot be removed, cannot be altered. Hence. Uh, a perfect security device. And I imagine we're going to see a lot of young people running to get this device. And it's tragic because we are seeing a generation lost, not because of their behavior, but sacrificed because of their parents. I don't know why the Lord just gave me that word. That is horrifying, Lord. I don't want to say that to the people. To sacrifice, because people are concerned about the young people. They know they, they want a, a dictatorship. They want uh, political correctness and force. They want, you know, I'm sure they want people to be killed as well. They're not the same kind of people. There's something kind of off with them, like they're not quite intact as all the other generations of children have been. And, you know, I, I believe that this is a judgment of God. I believe the reason they're not the same or they're different is to, as, a, um, as a marker of an end of humanity as we know it, but also uh, to mark a, a beginning point for the unraveling of, you know, the entire thing. Already you have Citibank screaming and yelling that the world is in a financial complete collapse and meltdown. You have Obama having gotten on the airwaves to say, the economy not that bad. We, we saved it. Um, you know, I mean, but again, the reason that he doesn't get press coverage is because every time he speaks, he lies. And people are bored with him. Hence the power that he was wielding over the Congress, which is why they, he rolled them, not because of himself, but because he was endued with power, and that power can make unfortunate accidents occur to people that would challenge him in any way, shape, or form. And that power is now weaning, waning, and as it wanes away, you will see enemies of, of his come forth with tremendous strength and um, for the people who think that somehow all these people get away with all their satanism and all their um, lying and all their um, wars for personal profits and all their beheading of Christians through ISIS their proxy army that they'll never get caught for any of this stuff got another thing coming they already are as I'm saying it the whole world knows it it's just that the, there are people that are on the same spiritual side as Obama. And so they will cover for him about ISIS or anything else or Hillary or whatever the rest of them. Uh, the, all this criminality is okay with them because they too are criminals. They agree with the criminality. They've consented to it. They want the corruption. They want the um, totalitarian regime. They want people punished for, for existing. They want... Um, I'm sorry, punished for existing, but given the elixir of immorality 
uh, you know, no longer do you have to worry about what the Bible says or morals. You can kind of do whatever your libido wants it to do, and you're fine. Uh, that's given to them as a consolation prize for their consenting corruption. Make no mistake, they are as guilty as the Congress, as the perpetrators themselves. Because, I mean, when you get people in the wag the dog thing where real heads are being cut off, real Christians, I would not want to be these people standing before the Almighty God at any time. These are Satanists. Anyone involved with ISIS is a Satanist, not a Muslim. I want to make that point very, very clear. And all of these killings of Christians are sacrifices for power to their God. It is so easy to see this that I am horrified that it's not just bandied about on the evening news because it's so obvious. That would make the entire evening news and all the media Satanists. Oh, they may not be going to rituals or killing anyone, but by proxy they are, so they are on Satan's side. That's what I mean. No, nothing so absurd and exotic here. They're on Satan's side. Those who backed ISIS are themselves uh, blood-sacrificing, worshipping Satanists. Structurally, hierarchically, they run the world system. Those in, al in allegiance with them, I don't care if they go to church 50 times a day, they are seen by God as on Satan's side and never on Jesus' side. If they worship 25,000 times a day, they are not seen as Christian. You know, Christian's a bad word even. They're not seen as children of God because they're not. The Lord is the only one that can make you a child of the Most High God. He makes you that. You don't just become that when you decide to. Besides, the Bible acts like it's progressive, but let's face it, before we're born, it's already decided what we are. It's not like you progress into being a child of God. I know they had Nimrod progressing into being like a Nephilim, a child of the devil. Um, but before Nimrod was born, he's a child of the devil, you understand? This progressive thing is something we do in 3D time space, but it's, it's not right. It's not real. In the end, there's, everything is what it is. And that's the thing that I so hate about this world here is the war against reality. Of, you know, that a, a simple perception as I, and simple logic, as I just dis displayed to you, ladies and gentlemen, um, is, is, you know, this is what gets me banned from uh, dinner parties. <laughs> they want to argue it. They, they want to have a different point of view. This is what got my friend, the, the big-time artist out in L.A., the, 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 the driver of our, um, I mean, I'm just horrified that this is the driver of our carpool, someone I really, I really love this guy. He was like an older brother. And he rejected me because of what I had said on the Zephyr report, I guess, when I likened the church to Mystery Babylon. I think that was his objection. And then that's it. I'm like, well, wait a second. What about using logic? What about hearing me out? No, he was not going to hear me out. He didn't hear what he wanted to hear, and that was it, as far as he was concerned. So he would cut off me, a child of the Most High God, to protect his illusion of being a child of the Most High God and his little fiefdom of the art world and him protecting his little you know, sliver of territory, which is meaningless in the end. Uh, and risking his very soul in the end, all because he could not see the simplest of things, that there might be something wrong with the 501c3 church. He, he just couldn't see that. That is someone being division. That's a, I, I suppose then, he in his mind, I am a devil. 
So we sacrifice all that good times we had as kids and how we looked up to this guy, four years older, I guess, three, four, and how he tried to indoctrinate me into the Chuck Smith way of uh, saving hippies in Costa Mesa, California, under the big tent. Meaning he'd always been in the system. But my kind of Christian, what would you do, friend, if, if Elijah showed up at your door, would you just put a, take out a gun and blow his head off? Is that what you'd do? Would you mock him? Would you reject him? Well, what would he do? I can tell you this, if Elijah, Elijah showed up today in America's church, any 501c3, I don't care whether it's Catholic, Protestant, this, that denomination, it doesn't matter, uh, he would be um, rejected utterly. And then he would go out and he would find his own among the masses. And those masses that he would find would not be acceptable in the modern church system. But they would be the children of God, not the ones in the buildings with the steeples and the crosses and the little outfits and the little collars and all their cute paraphernalia. Um, no. They would be rejected by God from the get-go for posing as God, for presenting a false gospel and a false God. You know, steering it the way they want or the way they're, um, you know, jump through the hoop divinity school, which is run by Satan. Uh, basically, what they get taught in divinity school, they're going to regurgitate so they can keep their little job and their little assignment of a church somewhere in the middle of wherever it is. And really what they ultimately want to do is control the people of a particular town and make sure they all stay on the same uh, course and they all stay on the same page with Satan, that they all stay completely un saved while saying they're saved in a double-minded um, opera of complete division, deceit, and destruction worldwide. In China, George Bush went to the church during the Olympics, the above-ground approved-of church in China. He said it was fantastic. Meanwhile, the real Christians there are being persecuted and killed for just having a Bible while he's doing a little jig. So how is he not a Satanist? Answer, he's a big time Satanist and there is no other way of looking at it based on the evidence of his approval of the fake communist church. That means that everybody involved in this sort of, you know, unrepented skull and bonezer um, would also, I mean, what, what is it, skull and bones or the Lord? If it's not skull and bones, then skull and bones should be overtly rejected along with certain privileges of high society. They weren't. What is a reasonable person to conclude then? Okay, the obvious. Why doesn't anyone tell the emperor he's naked? Because they're afraid of, of excoriation, because they're afraid of... Of, 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 of being arrested. They're afraid of being hurt. So we all live in this little Disneyland bubble, and I was told by a young person the other day, just go along with it. It's a lot easier. That's right. To stay the course with the Lord for real, which is, you know, unusual in, in this country, and in fact, almost non-existent, uh, one has to fight. Yeah, one, one has to actually fight people that claim to be experts in this, quote, religion, unquote. One has to fight with, with, with things that happen that are unfair and untoward that are popping right out of the blue, just, just unfair treatment out of nowhere. Having to fight with witches and new agers and sorcerers and all these other things, these people run our society. 
They're the ones who approve of the churches and put the rules in place. Oh, now they're all screaming Islam, but that's a ruse. They don't believe in that. They're using that to enslave the, the world's population. They're using migration, Islam, everything else. And ultimately, they're going to you know, do some mass killing and a bloodbath to uh, get rid of the people of the Lord. These are the most ignorant people that have ever... Obama leads the stupidest of the stupid. He's one of the stupidest people, actually, that has ever drawn breath and has ever held any office anywhere. He sounds smart, yes, with a script or whatever, but he's actually incredibly stupid because he prides himself on knowing something or another. He doesn't know history. He doesn't know, um, the obviously, God. He has nothing but sycophants and, and, and uh, suck-ups counseling him on how to act like a Christian, uh, you, know, you know, acting teachers. To, you know. he, he does this prayer breakfast thing and is, is, is such a yawn that I, I, I have to actually, I have to turn it off, I have to walk away because I, he so sullies himself before the Lord. He so embarrasses himself before the kingdom of God. He's so, he's so um, unbelieving of anything. He just believes he is what's happening. And as he gets older, it makes no dent on him whatsoever. This is a man in need of great tragedy in his life. This is a man who needs but will be denied great tragedy. Because great tragedy would change him. So he will be spared great tragedy in order to keep up. God will allow him to keep continue just the way he is, as one of the most embarrassing people that has ever lived, but has the worship of many, showing that they are utter embarrassments of birth. And perhaps, in my view, it would have been better had they not been born. But there it is. God has allowed their incredible arrogance and stupidity to be on display for all to see. Guffaw, guffaw, do a jig and laugh because they're so pathetic. And yet there they are, trying to be important as our leaders. And so I guess the bane of Mr. Obama's existence would be the fact that when he got up to talk about the economy, when all this news was spiraling down, the market's spiraling down, he, he's in real trouble he gets up to speak and he's blotted out <laughs> because he just doesn't have the ratings like he used to. People are just tired of listening because they know that it's all meaningless. Josh Ernest continues to spout his inane stupidity also of how the economy was saved by the abomination administration. And there are more people out of work and there's more overwhelm to this system. The system is destroyed. It's a George Soros wet dream provided by Obama while the people said, oh, we're doing 5%, 5%, yay, Obama. Yay, Hillary. And um, bringing me back to the subject of this podcast, which is now you're going to see you know, holy hell unleashed upon the earth. And it's not for you. You are here to be a witness of them. And the good may be killed with the bad. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. But um, you're here as a witness. You must really strengthen your faith in the Lord. Do what you've got to do. I mean, I have a, a lot of work in that regard because I'm, fighting off all kinds of things, and I'm noticing internally my own weaknesses and my own foibles and a lot of my own things that need to be strengthened, and I just feel terrible, too. You talk about embarrassment. I mean, I'm, I know to be embarrassed over my own behavior, though, you see. I know to be embarrassed over my weaknesses within. I know that I have flesh and all kinds of proclivities and things that have, you know, Maybe no fault of my own, but things that, that, that open me up to, um, you know, attacks from the other side, let's say. And, you know, these are things that I, I've, you, know, you need deliverance from me. These are doors that need to be shut. And I feel terrible about that. I, I always said I was a sinner here and I'm no good in that way, you know, not 
not an example, a role model, certainly. And things that have plagued me since childhood, you know, that I just couldn't seem to shake, you know. And, and no, it's not my fault, but it's, it's, I got I to gotta deal with it. I'm sure you have things like that, too. So a lot of the problem we have in being fervent, you know, is we don't have the illusion of the satanic Disneyland pastor or Disneyland workers of God, you know what I mean? That's the, you know, the church system. We don't have that at our back, you know, backing us up. You know, so we have a lot of self-loathing. We got a lot of people, you know, self-medicating and self-loathing, you know, and just are embarrassed of themselves and don't want to, can't present themselves as some kind of, you know, someone worthy of speaking and, and, and dividing the word before the public or on YouTube or wherever. They, they don't, and certainly I have to preface all this by saying, look, look at me, a mess. But I fought back, you know, and, um, you know, what the witches want to do with me is they want me to just give up. Well, they come and they go, you know, throughout my life, and they want me to give up. And they can, they're men and women. It's part of the system. It's not, you know, let's not get into the, you know, the, the, the kind of fairy tale thing here, okay? And um, they just want me to kind of go along, give up, and they try to show me my, <clears throat> my sins, you know, show me my weaknesses, show me how I'm, it's ridiculous that I would try to be this man of God or even attempt to, to, to share things of the spiritual journey with people because I'm obviously not worthy. Show me where I fall short. You know what I mean? Show me where I, you know, therefore I should just <laughs> take it easy on myself and just kind of <clears throat> submit to their humiliation of me and, you know, and make my life into one big fetish, I suppose. Whatever it is, um, I don't think I want to go down that path, but in order not to, I have to fight back. You know, I'm not going to go into any kind of confession here, but I'll just say that it's, um, you know, they watch you, you know, they find your weakness, you know, they try to, they try to exploit that. And they'll, you know, it's, it's very, very high tech too, and demonic and tied in with millions and trillions of beings. And you're, you're dealing with the big principalities of wickedness. You're not just dealing with one person. You know, so you're dealing with the whole thing that, you know, so what are you really to fight with? Well, the fight you have and the fight that I'm talking about is for your very soul, my friend. And I have to fight for mine because if I just take my eyes off the ball one second, given my own weaknesses and everything else, meaning off the Lord, um, they could they could have, do what they will with me in a New York minute. I mean, they could just have me. They could... Uh, they could put me on a conveyor belt and slice me up and sell me at the market. I mean, they can do all kinds of things, you know, that that, uh, that if the Lord doesn't intervene, I'm, I mean, on a daily basis, in a, in a, several times a day, if he doesn't intervene, um, you know, they'll, they'll have their way. Well, if you're not going to play ball, they're going to ruin your life, and, you know, most people play ball, and then you just become, because you're a prodigal, you know what I mean? You'll always be a child of God in the wrong place. They will just treat you as an eighth-class citizen and expect you to do as you're told. And, you know, and, and basically you have no privacy. You have no, you know, no children, no wife, no nothing. You belong to them. And they'll do what they want with you including sacrifice you if it pleases them. And there is no easy way to go here. You don't just take it easy like the stupid eagles said and float on downstream. Um, it doesn't work that way. You do that and they'll have their way with you. Unless you're one of them. And then, you know, but then you, you would have known that when you were eight years old. I mean, you know, there's just no easy way here. Let me just put it this way for you prodigals. They're not your friend. You can, you can do whatever they say, play the game, try to work your way up in the schmoozing thing. For all your effort, you'll get maybe 10% back on your 100% effort. If you're one of them, they make 50% effort and they get 300% back. Now, by now, you should have noticed that 
discrepancy. And that will determine who you belong to. I rest my case. I'm, I'm not going to go through this over and over again with you people. You know, I'm assuming that you all know who, where you're at and who you are by now. If you're a child of God, you know, but you hate the church and you hate the whole Christian, well, the, this ought to be good for you to hear then this podcast. But nonetheless, we still have to understand. I was here, I, in my mind, oh, there was, a, you know, go ask Alice, you know, the Jefferson airplane. And I was marveling at what a great mix and a great vocal mix for Grace Slick that was. I mean, that was just so powerful of a track. And then I had images could smell the marijuana. I could see the little rainbow thing around the lights from taking mescaline, you know, and smoking dope and hanging around when bands would be playing in the dark. There are bands everywhere, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, like guitar, bass, and drum just jamming for, you know, hours while the smoke is wafting up and then they're playing records like, you know, Go Ask Alice and and don't you want somebody to love and all those things, you know, and, and all the rest of the music that came at that time. But this song was very iconic of hallucinogenic, you know, feed your head and all that, you know. And I was just marveling at the top-down control and, and pressure and structure of the rituals, my friend. I mean, there wasn't this free-form thing going on like oh it's it was a structural free form that was enforced just like you don't have to go to school here and we have a prog uh, my school became progressive so they said if you don't want to show up to class you don't have to whatever you it was like it was like you know common core on steroids if well whatever you think it is it is you know what I mean it was like all that coming out of that whole program top down top down so Go Ask Alice was top-down control. It wasn't some free-form thing. I mean, they, obviously, the artists, whatever they thought, it doesn't matter. They were used. You see, it was in for the smoke wafting up and people lying around and on the floor. It's all dark, and, you know, they're kind of having sex with each other or they're, they're finding drugs to take, and they're, or they're just really grooving to the music, you know. They're just kind of like be here now and there's all this influence of Eastern religions and you know the smoke is wafting up and the incense is burning and you're in some private house at a party and there's this you know there's three guys jamming in the dark you know no lights on them right no lights you can see the lights of their amplifiers glowing you know the drums were not mic they're just there you know and they're they're jamming like it's cool man they're just they're just getting into all kinds of interesting you know jamming And you think, oh, how free. And then, you know, you're hearing the music wafting through, and you're hearing John Lennon, and you're hearing, you know, the Jefferson Airplane, and you're hearing McCartney singing, and you're hearing the different bands of different times, and you're hearing all the kind of feel-good party bands playing, and the Rod Stewart's voice coming on, and then you hear, you know, you hear, like, even older, more psychedelic kind of tunes from... Two years before, like, the, you know, from San Francisco, there were a bunch of bands that are forgotten by now. You know, you're hearing Canned Heat, right? You're hearing these very songs. You're hearing The Doors. You're hearing all this stuff, and it's all very contemporary, and the smoke is wafting up, and people are, like, you know, doing this sort of hippie thing. Then you notice, as I start walking through the house, in this case, I'm in some kind of a mansion in Hancock Park, and I'm walking around. It's a... It's a um, Italian classical architecture. I think you, those of you who understand know what I mean. And um, so I'm, the living room is where the band is, and then there's a big kitchen, all these kind of people laughing and eating, you know, marijuana brownies and dropping acid, and, and you're wandering around, and there's naked bodies here and there in the pool and whatnot, and you're, 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 you're starting to see that, you know, there's a great deal of management going on here. And you're starting to realize, 
wait a second, this isn't free love. This isn't freedom. Wait a second now. Those guys playing the music, wait a sec, who are they? They're these. They're, 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 these are made, these are controller type people. What are they doing? And then you're, you're wandering through and you're seeing people from school, you know. And they're suddenly cool. You know, it's like, suddenly cool. Wait a sec, how'd you get cool? So suddenly you got cool. Something changed there, cosmically, like the stars realigned. Well, where's the other honcho? Then you see them. There'll be the gal there, acting like she's sort of partying, but she's watching very closely, making sure everything is going just so in a very structural manner. And you're seeing other people, you know, here and there kind of with a gentle hand of managing but trying to look like they're not managing. And then you go back and look at all these parties that you went to and you realize they were all managed from a top-down hyper-control standpoint. I mean, really severe. So there wasn't just lying around being hippies on the floor and getting off on stuff and free to be like children exploring consciousness and one another and no, no, it was all enforced. Every once in a while, there'd be somebody who'd go from uncool to cool. You know, they suddenly got, like, real cool. They were then wearing the clothes. And but there's something changed in them. And you're seeing these, these invasion of the body snatchers, you know, is what's making them cool, you know. It's not really, <clears throat> it's not right. It's not just the drugs and the, the outfit and the haircut. No, there's some kind of, thing going on there, something. And then you start realizing, oh my God, this entire thing I'm at is 100% fake. This is like some kind of factory. They're here to scalp souls, man. Steering it into the best possible, the best possible atmosphere for that scalpage of that soul. You know, when one is unaware, it's, oh, go ahead, take me. And um, then I'm wondering, how come there are not more murders around here? It seems that you could just kill all these people and it would be, you know, cleaned up by the morning. Something is frightening me at this point, in other words. And I must be on my way. And then Jimi Hendrix comes on. And then it's like all cool and you get outside and you see those old street lamps in Hancock Park. They have a big rainbow glow around each one, probably from the mescaline. And then you, you know, you get your way down. You're hitchhiking at two in the morning down, you know, Beverly Boulevard, trying to get out of there. And uh, never once. It was just part of the, the, the parents were out of town, you know, that's why the party was there. The kids didn't have any money, you know. They were in, out of town, but they weren't out of town, were they? No, they were there. This was planned. And this is just one incident. Now let's multiply that by all these parties going on in all the cities across the country. The same thing in 1969, right? 1968, 1969. And now suddenly I can see the controllers and the honchos managing it all in, a very, in their own very progressive manner. While at the time it looked like just whacked out, people just doing drugs and being hedonist, you know. But no, it was every once in a while someone would suddenly go become cool. They were screaming and crying and they were uncool. And then they, they, they suddenly became cool. They suddenly had the wind at their backs. And these parties were like a, and social cliques were like a, some sort of milieu for that sort of thing. For turning the frog into a prince. 
and it's swirling around with all the music and all, all the liberation going on. And the children are being liberated into what? Into slaves and mind control victims. And ultimately, because where they are today at my age, I mean, I'm one of the few people that's completely intact from my peer group. The rest of them are nobody home, you know. They were all indoctrinated in those parties. Many of them became cool. Now, of course, they're dead, but, you know, literally dead. They die, you know, they die. You don't have to wait till you're 70 to die. People die on the way. Plenty die in their 60s. And uh, I just wonder, you know, and um, they would have their VWs, their VW vans, try to act like vagabonds and they got their you know lid of weed and they're smoking and driving around in their van looking for girls to put in the back and have sex with and and it was all everything it was all just orchestrated none of it was real folks do you realize that Everything on television, all the music, everything, none of it was real. So I kept hearing this, go ask Alice, you know. And I'm like, why am I hearing that? And then it was to take me on this journey to show me how fake it all is. I mean, was, but to me now it is. To show me that it was all a sham and a lie to begin with. And even the lyrics of those songs, trying to, look, they don't mean anything, Seth. It's just they're being, they're being out there. They're feigning, feigning depth when it's really just shallow and even non-allegorical. Okay. So the hookah smoking caterpillar has given you the call, eh? To go on this journey as Alice. And the bottom line is, at the end of the day, it's just a satanic ritual. It's the birth of Alice as something dead. as a dead girl, celebrated in her transformation. Now all of you children do likewise. Go ask Alice. Go on the same journey. You'll be glad you did. Take her easy. See you on down the trail. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, well, same thing every generation, kid. Nod and wink. Yeah. So tell me what that is. Well, what it is is this is a person who loses their soul but gains the world. Ah, like the Bible says. Es correcto. They lose their soul in exchange for the world. That is, yes, now you're right. See, two plus two really does equal four in the end. But for all intents and purposes, it's six. See, that way they know you're going to play. That way they know they got something from you. Here, you can have my soul. Every time someone tries to grab that soul, someone gets killed, Zeph. That's a problem. Yeah, but I'm not doing it. No, you see, I'm not really going to be offering my soul um, because I don't want to see anyone get, I just don't want any trouble. You know, I just want to quietly go with my Lord. If, 
if that's okay with you all out there who think you're so cocky and think you can just beat me. Well, anyone could beat me, but what happens if he wants me? You didn't think of that part. Well, look at all the trail of bodies. Obviously, he wants me to be around. You know, until he doesn't, I guess. Who knows when that'll be? Anyway, what I'm alluding to is, you know, the, 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 the spiritual warfare the ongoing throughout the, especially in my youth, you know. And, and today, a lot of those people have passed on, you know, some through normal, whatever, just old age, others through cancer and various things. But it's just weird how I'm here and they're not. And they were leading like this one guy. He was tallying up the whole thing. I said, what are you, what are you doing? It's, and then he was, you know, keeping book on them gambling on me. And he said, you know, it's like we're all, all the lambs are like being gambled on, like, like a horse race. To whether they be killed or whether they be initiated, one or the other. And I'm like, that's not, well, anyway, that guy's dead, so... He reached out to me on Facebook, and I always thought he was alive. Then I found out he died in 2014. I saw him on a video, a 2012 school reunion thing, and he looked like he was in tip-top health. But that whole gambling thing he was doing, he, he thinks I don't remember that, but I remember that. That was another party where mom and dad were away, and... And the purpose of the party was a top-down, structural um, all these parties were like, you know, induction centers. Kind of like, you know, you know, I had this thing about the moon where there was a, a soul scalping device there, you know, and then, I mean, that, and I didn't think much of it. I thought it was just a fantasy, it was a, a vision I had. And then until John Lear came up and said the same thing, I'm like, oh, that freaked me out. And it was a few years later that he said that. And, uh, I'd seen something else there, too. I think it was another dimension. I think I was just like, I was taken. That, 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 that happened to me a lot, where I was just taken places, you know, and shown things. Anyway... It's more complex than people know, the whole hierarchy and structure of all this stuff and, you know, the beings that you don't see and what runs the world and, you know, and it just, when I'm looking at the party I see, the party is happening in an ant farm, you know what I mean? And the, you know how it is when you have an ant farm and you kind of, you know, want the ants to build a certain way or you know how you kind of shape what the ants are going to do and you watch them? I mean, that's kind of it, right? So these... Parties are like harvest centers where they are taking souls of people and then rendering them cool. And induction centers, and it was all very structural. The drugs, the drink, the, um, you know, the love-ins, the music, the event had nothing to do with what it appeared to be on the surface. It had to do with commodities. Can't believe it. So that's why the song came into my mind. Because ultimately, even though Grace sings it very powerfully, it's about nothing. It's about nothing. It's about less than nothing. The song is completely, utterly insignificant and irrelevant because it's simply a pacifier, a, a nudger that will nudge someone in a certain direction for the purpose of the top-down, hierarchical, totalitarian scalpola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby. That's... Why am I going back to the past? Because the past, as I wrote in my lyrics, you know, that Trish song, so beautifully, um, past isn't dead. So I just wandered through those, 
they were like twin brothers out there in Hancock Park. You know, they were, I guess they played guitar and they had their amplifiers on and they were, but they were, they were honchos. They were, they were moving things a certain direction. They were on the team, as it were, on the inside track. <laughs> Not cool at all. More like, you know, I, the, the way I look at these guys are more akin to, uh, who had this party, there's more akin to, which is why I went and visited, you know, one of many different parties, but more akin to um, the, the Nazi brown shirts is why I look at them at now. In other words, they were there reporting back to the enemy, the enemy of humanity, that is, seeing which ones they could get. Acting like it's all peace, love, groovy, man. It's just psychedelic, you know. It's just all cool. It's just all whatever. It's, you know, just do your thing, man. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, love who you want or don't, you know, just, it's all free, you know. It's all cool, man. You know, here's some, whatever kind of your flavor of drug or poison is, whatever, just kind of blow your mind, man. You know, just blow your mind. But it wasn't like just go blow your mind, was it? Like, do your own thing. No, there was no do you. This was very strict. Everyone was watched. Everyone was corralled. Everyone was nudged. Everyone was moved. And, you know, they would tally up the night by how many they got. One pill makes you larger and one pill makes you small. The ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all. That's absurd. Nonsense. Doesn't matter. It was the whole vibe of it. Suffused with drugs. Suffused with, you know, added layers of meaning imposed upon it to create a certain narrative that each person was in on their way to something scary so that they would give in ultimately. Like, go ask Alice, so sung so fervently, like it was so important when obviously it was nonsense. You know, it was like comparing Alice in Wonderland to psychedelics. And the frightening thing of logic and proportion going out the window, now what do you do? You having a bad trip, whatever? Come on in here, we'll make it good for you. I remember Jesus appeared when I had a bad trip. And, you know, the handlers were working on me, you know. They were all working on me, it seemed. And I was spiraling into a bad trip, and they were really handling me. And then I had this vision of Jesus. I was maybe 17, 16, something like that. I had a vision of Jesus. He was right at the door there, and bright, glowing, and the next thing you knew, the effect of the psychedelic was completely neutralized. It was gone, boom, gone. And then I was like, hey, cool. Let's go play volleyball, man. And, and the people that were kind of working on me, they flipped out, they went insane. And they had to be dealt with with psychiatrists and things. You know, and I said, well, what is my recovering from a downward spiral acid trip, you know, obviously planned by you people. And then suddenly Jesus appeared and I recovered. As if I never took any, <clears throat> any such thing. Of course, I should have known better. They use LSD to get their way with you, not for you to open your mind and blow your mind. And see what they saw in me, they didn't expect to see. They saw this. Well, they saw the Lord. They saw the power. He was pure light, pure, pure power. That's what they saw. Well, I, you know, you'd think that after an incident like that, I would have just given my life totally to the Lord, and that would have been the end of it. It would have been like that right then. I should have. I wish I had. It would have been a lot less painful. There, I would have, there, the, the less traumatic because you would understand. Not less you know, warfare, but, but less dramatic because you would understand where all this was coming from, right? So those hippie loving things, those little L.A. parties, 
1,000% fake, every single one of them. Every single one was a structure which was engineered by the three-piece suits back in the boardroom. And with the cooperation of the government, right, law enforcement and everybody else on the team trying to get the old ticky-washy routine happening. Just a gimmick, the hippie thing, to get what they want anyway, what they've always wanted. The real reality that's going on here on Earth. Not the fake surface Disneyland BS reality, but the real one. And now I would ask you, okay, so now where are you? Here's where we are, and here's what the point of the podcast was, and this is gonna, I'm going to wrap it up here. Right now, the people that orchestrate all that stuff, again, the hippie movement, just a gimmick, another way of trying to you know, dress the machine up, but the same machine, right? Right now, their lives are in the balance, all these so-called honchos, and all, I mean, this generation, the new generation, and they're going to be sacrificed in a blood sacrifice as a rebuke to their parents and to the whole world and to the society itself. The mass suicides will begin not that long from now. And they'll keep putting a good face on it like, well, things are going pretty well. It's like Obama. He gets out talking about the economy. He's always going well. I saved it. It's like, sir, you have, you know, over half your people unemployed. And, you know, the ma major banks screaming that it's over. And he's out there parading around like the, the, the fool he really is. As if anything he says matters anyway to anyone for any reason, which it doesn't. They just give him, you know, they nod, nod at him and like they're listening while they're yawning and falling asleep. Oh, I know he got a lot of respect at the prayer meeting and a lot of respect at the, you know, I know that they're all acting like they really, you know, but I, it is what it is, right? In other words, he's part of the surface Disneyland thing, Obama is. So therefore, he's not really relevant to what's going on. So all this pain and suffering that is to come will affect mainly them, or the worlders, by showing them that the zero-sum game they've been enjoying so deliciously has been revoked. And everything about these people is a failure, a screaming, haughty, insipid, stupid, ridiculous, unnecessary failure as it all comes crashing down. And they're talking about how we could never let a guy like Trump lead. Right? They'd rather die or kill him or, you know, or have Hillary Clinton or whatever finish the thing off and stick a fork in it rather than let you know, someone try to fix anything. So intent are they of drowning all the people here taking everyone down with their little boat, that they're going to stay the course no matter what. And all these people that are leading the show here, running the show, not any, even one of them deserves to be there. All have been flushed down the toilet when they're in their youth. Or if you like, ticky-washy. You know, they gave one thing up and they got... Uh, this illusory job and career path as if they matter, as if, you know, their little bureaucratic job means anything, which, of course, it's meaningless. But, uh, you know, they, they keep you believing in it, that it's not meaningless. But I'll, almost every job here, can, can you really trace back to where it's meaningful? The ho-hum thing, you know, it's, it's really difficult for me because I feel all this overwhelm right now, a tremendous overwhelm of, of uh, negativity in the spiritual realm, you know, and I just, I see this 
the war, you know, and I see this that's uncovered by Donald Trump, you know, with his escapades. And the other day, you know, I was talking about cussing and I've, I said BS, but I mean, I, you know, it's been curbed a lot, you may notice. But he let the F-bomb fly and the, the, you know, he's doing it to show the hypocrisy of all the, you know, news agency and everybody who's all upset. And Jeb Bush seizes on it saying, you can't be president if you talk like that, you know, like, like, well, what's the Bush family involved in in the back room, you know? Not that I want to know, but I mean, how do they get so squeaky clean to make that judgment? Like, they never say the F-bomb? Yeah, well, we would never say it on TV like that. Again, hypocrites. That's right, Glenn Fry, the founding member of the Eagles, he, he croaked. Yeah. They tried to blend the kind of like cool satanic thing in with the country at rock and came up with this sort of feminized hybrid thing. Um, well, my only advice to them would have been, you know, while the guy was still alive, why don't you just come out and say what you mean? Rather than beating around the bush. You know, uh, own it, man. If that's what you want to do, speak up. Answer. The notion of that scares them to death because you see at the end of the day, they've, they're not going to own it, folks. They're not going to take any responsibility at all. They're going to say, go to Wikipedia. And you go to Wikipedia and everything is above board and fine. Nothing means anything. It's about when a guy went through a divorce or, you know, talking about the political climate or the, you know, it's all... You know, writing about the fact that they were writing about the Camarillo Mental Hospital or whatever back in the day. They weren't really writing about a, an allegory or metaphor of real life, uh, of celebrity life, of, you know, the real deal. It's, it's just about this one place in California. You know, I'm thinking of Hotel California. It's not about anything beyond that. Nothing means anything, and Wikipedia is there to just make sure it all stays on the surface. Nothing describes anything that I've talked about, nothing. Trish was telling me that they were using this low spark of high-heeled boys to kind of get people into this orgy thing of some party she went to when she was in her youth. It made her very uncomfortable, and she eventually... You know, it wasn't that so much that people were getting sexual with each other. It was that it was this indoctrination kind of thing. And they were using it for the mind control. If you go look up Low Spark of High Heeled Boys, Stevie Winwood and, and, and Traffic on um, Wikipedia, it's just about, the guy goes, oh, it's just about life on the street. Well, that's true, I suppose. You know, that it is about that. But basically, it's about the satanic world system and, and, you know, taking your place in it. Or you could get killed. It's real simple. High-heeled in, Brit, in, 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 in Brit lingo means wealthy. Wealthy. You know, the wealthy Satanists are running the world. And they have rules for you getting into the club, that's all. They're actually talking about some very elite stuff there, not the street at all, but it's more the club, the leather chairs, the 50-year-old scotch, you know, it's more of that crowd. That's okay, it doesn't matter. It's, it was just used for indoctrination because the, the tune was so creepy and it's, you know, and, and, they, and they just the, the whole thing was channeled from uh, the pits of hell. Well, it could be, you know, the whole point of the of track was to get into your head, you know, to, to, if you're, you know, to, to, to communicate something to you. You know, again, top down hierarchical structure, meaning, you know, we want something on it. You don't, you're not going to be left alone here. You know, your commodity, act like it. 
And uh, you're saying, I'm just here to, uh, I'm just like, you know, I'm here and I'm, well, that's too bad. You know, all this is going on and you're going to listen. So anyway, so this party she was at started turning into an orgy as a result of the song being on because it has that kind of hypnotic sort of, you know, quality. When you add that to drugs and everything else, it starts turning it into, um, you know, and that kind of orgy, by the way, is where even if you have sex in it, it, you're not there yourself. Something takes you over and is, it is having the sex, not you. Anyway, she got out of there because it gave her the creeps. I'm like, yeah, well, it's the same thing as high school. You know, the same hierarchy in the playground. Same thing, repeated endlessly, endlessly. Like you're born here and they want, you know, your, 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 your uh, and they want your life. You know, but you have to lay it down. You got to give it up. And then they give you a ticket, you know, to ride around on the, on the various rides. You don't buy a ticket to the world. You basically die. And that, if unchecked, that is the second death. That is the unredeemable problem. You know, when dead is dead, dead doesn't come back to life. It's dead, it's gone. So rather than calling yourselves the grateful dead, which would be a mis understanding of, of reality. It should be the un, uh, it should be the uh, the ignorant dead. The stupid dead. The um, dare I say it? The lazy dead. Too lazy to actually, you know, do the basic common sense thinking that would, would you know, would, would, would put the whole decision in a better light. Um, people end their lives here too young before they ever know what, what life is. So are we giving them up? And with great encouragement from, you know, which then begs the question, brings us to the next level of this thing which is the people here are basically the dead. So where are we? Are we, may I pose the question? And I know I'm not going to get a, you know, at least I won't get a, I used to get all these glib answers like, well, this is what it is or that's what it is. No, no. Is this Hades? Did we wind up here? to be in this endless repeat of this being hunted until we finally die again. And then we, then do we die again and again and again? Or is, we're, we're just the sorry dead or the, you know, that's it, you're dead. And, you know, you, what you have to look forward to is your funeral, uh, you know, here in this, in this realm. And then depending on what you do, you go to a worse realm of Hades or a worse realm of hell or, a worse, or, or you go to heaven what exactly is this, first of all, before we start talking about the next place? Where you're hunted and, and, and through all kinds of means to use consent to basically die in exchange for some kind of fake ride in a, um, you know, 10-second... Uh, you know, a 20-second ride on a bumper car. I mean, what exactly is this? I mean, are we dead somehow? Maybe, you know, I didn't make it out of that coma. I'm dead here, along with everybody else. And is the repetition of the Luciferic cosmogony, that is, the initiatory rites of Lucifer, i.e., is it a soul that he's taking or are the souls already gone? It's the consent that he wants. Somehow that can't be violated. That's the important thing is the free will, right? That's where the power is. 
Power to do what? Kill more people? Wreak more havoc? Cause more misery? Is that what rock and roll did? It caused great misery? Did it scalp all the souls of America? And that's why America was conquered? Oh, you're one of those book-burning prejudiced people. <laughs> oh, no, I, no, no, I'm, I'm looking at what it really is. Come on in, the water is fine. Materialism, yes. Is that why we have the three to four minute songs now? Because we don't want people to think, we don't want them to feel, we don't want them to go places. We don't want to take them on a journey. So we dumb their attention span down so they can't ever blossom, they can't think, they can't. It's all, everything's in sound bites so that you can keep them on the hook. I mean, even if you don't take the Nazi initiation, right, to serve the Nazis and kill your fellow Jews in Auschwitz, even if you don't take that deal of having some filet mignon in exchange for putting them in the gas chambers and, and in the crematoriums, you know what I mean, being a, 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 a traitor Jew, right, and you get, you get the, the perks, and then you still die. They still blow your head off at, you know, for before the next batch of Jews comes in to be gassed and exterminated. You still die. You just get a little better cut, a little better treatment during your time for your free will consent, meaning becoming a traitor to humanity is what it really means. Going over to the other side means serving that which is against humanity. So they give you a little perk. Otherwise, why would they pay you for? What would they need you for? They wouldn't. So you come back and you convince people to do likewise and bust on through the other side. And in, in exchange for that, you get another perk. You can build up those perks insofar as you turn in humanity. And you keep on feeding souls to the one who, so, who, who supposedly set you free. Set you free to be a slave, but not set you free to be free. At long last, before the mass death occurs, can we just stipulate that I'm right on this point? Your Honor, just for once could we just stipulate that there's no other way to look at it. I don't expect it to be written up in Wikipedia or in any book in the, in the philosophy library or in the occult books of, uh, of the Vatican even. I don't expect you to find any of this anywhere. You see, the, the nod wig thing is... People think they can read about it in a book, forgetting that it's going on everywhere and everything and everyone, and, and it's, it's a dynamic that doesn't exist in a, in a physical realm. So no, you're not going to find it in a book. Books can go so far, but they can't, they can't really conclude the whole matter. The earth is a dot, dot, dot for souls. Life on earth is a dot, dot, dot for souls. The real war on earth is dot, dot, dot for souls. People are involved in their individual lives. They battle for their very soul. Each individual upon the earth is engaged in a battle for their soul. And it goes back and forth across the line because we all have weaknesses that make us vulnerable to having our souls taken. We have weaknesses which can be exploited by the savvy enemy 
to put us into the realm of the dead and the twice dead. So of course I'd want to see all humanity saved from sure destruction, but I mean, if there was destruction, I think people wouldn't mind that so much. The idea that there's this lingering life that goes on like this, with less and less resources and more and more poverty and sickness and, 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 and war and pain and tragedy and hatred, more just descending further and further into, the, into that sort of thing and the godlessness and, um, you know, until finally, you know, you see humanity just being eaten by insects. Is it true that if you live a just and chaste, chaste, a chaste life, get your chastity belts out and have a life of sex denial, that that would save you? The answer is, of course not. Most of the perps in this thing, they didn't like sex anymore. They just get off on violence. I hate to put it that way, but that's how they get off. That's how they, that's how they fly, baby. That's it. It's on violence and destruction of people as a, uh, a mode to power and power that intoxicates them. And that's what their, that's what their thing is. No, not sex anymore. It's the, that, that is what is sexuality to them. That, that's an addiction. Okay? You, it slowly, you know, you, you go through it in your life until you finally get to that point. Controlling people, if you will, is the elixir of the, of, of the witchcraft. It's getting control of you. It's you giving your consent to them so they can control you and then agreeing that you'll, you know, just say yes to whatever you're told and before you know it, you're in. The problem is, not so easy to get out. Especially when you've been, you know, feeding at the trough all these years. How am I going to get out now? Well, if you're meant to get out, God will find a way for you to get out. It will be presented to you, ladies and gentlemen. This podcast, the timing of it is supernatural. The fact that it comes into your life and you're being told about all this and then you're being reminded of what life is all about here. Every single one of us has this struggle and none, none of us do it right. None of us are noble Sir Galahads here. We're, we're, we're failing all the time. We're giving in to weaknesses. We're being weak. We're falling back into lust, into, into thievery or into lying or into whatever it is. Well, doesn't that mean all humanity is going to be saved and you shouldn't just yell at Obama and all that because you're, well, I yell at Obama, that's my bias. I don't, you know, people like him, I just don't particularly care for, so I'm going to yell at him. You know, he's, he's, he's like a little bright moving object. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about him then. I could, we could talk about Dick Cheney if you like. But Dick Cheney is a genius. You know, I happen to, you know, not really dislike Dick Cheney. I, I, I don't know what it is. It, I, it's got to be this bias in me. I really, it's got to be that I'm, I'm just, have this terrible bias. You know, I really like Donald Trump, you know. But I'm in pretty good company there, actually. Well, I see him as the only solution, the, the only solution. And if, and if uh, the, 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 the Nazis get rid of him or whatever, um, then... Um, I see no solution except when the screaming begins, which, you know, I, I've been feeling all this in my body. I mean, I'm very, very much like, I feel earthquakes in my body and you know, I feel things. I mean, that's why I'm kind of reclusive because I, if, if so, I'm so sensitive that um, at times, like I, when I feel overwhelmed, you know, just like I have on the last few podcasts, you know, you hear it, you see it, hear it, the music. You know, I'm going to kill you, you know what I mean? That was, all this is coming out of this spot, this pain I'm feeling, but the pain is for something in the future, you see, that's how it works with me. 
It's like I'm picking up on it. Like a, animals before an earthquake. And now it's not so bad, really, right at this moment. It's like something kind of mollified, something changed. But it's been hard to, you know, really hard to, uh, you know, get to this microphone. I mean, I've been up uh, pondering all this stuff all night. I'm just, I just had to get to the microphone. And even if I brought nothing, you know, I, I'm just going back to those times, you know, revisiting something and then looking. As I'm wandering through the house, I'm seeing these. My God, there they are. I missed it last time. When I was there, I missed it. I missed the, the structure. I missed it completely. I'd, I, I thought it was some kind of, like I heard the song and I had this, uh, you know, Go Ask Alice song. Very strong, with really good recording of Grace Slick, really hitting those notes. A very powerful singer at that time. And I'm, and I'm shot back into this place with the incense and the, you know, and it could be a composite of many different parties, but there I am wandering around with people wandering around in the party and into bedrooms upstairs and in the kitchen and out at the pool, you know, just, you know what I mean. And it all seems like it's random, but then now you see as I'm walking through the, the little mansion, I'm seeing... My God, man, you're, this is all scripted, this is, it's all controlled, it's all, it's uh, the price of bacon, it's just, it's terrible, I see it, I oh God, I missed it, I, I was taken back to see it, I had to look at it today. You know, there they are, the people who are assigned, and here are the other people, the ones who they're running after. And that's all that's going on. There's nothing else. All the rest of it is a gimmick. You know, the incense, the drugs, the, the, the music, the cool, like, atmosphere of just creativity and just kind of blow your own mind, man, and just everything is everything. All that is just a ruse. All that, that's nothing. It's just this top-down, very structural, very, very strict, very organized, um, you know, uh, industry, business. But what do you say now, at long last, that um, with, the, with all of it ending and a generation to be sacrificed and the end of your lives, n now what do you say? See, that's more the point of the podcast. Now, at long last, here you're right there in your, in your chair at home or you're lying there listening to this through a, uh, an iPod or something or a, a phone or something. What do you have to say for yourself now, though? No, there aren't future generations. There isn't a future. There's just the time that's been allotted. What do you have to say about all those souls that are gone? They died, nobody even cared about them, you know. They just, if they had anything, the people fought over what they had to see if they could inherit it or whatever. But I mean, they, they were completely discarded in the last part of their lives. You know, they, they gave of themselves so generously only to be kicked in the teeth and now to be completely killed. What was the point of it all, of being a traitor? To have a little bit of better cut, a little better cut of meat. To live a few seconds longer. To be able to be led into the Nazis' uh, movie making and movie watching thing. To get some chocolate. What was the deal? Well, I know the answer. And now that no one is cool. Nobody that was cool in high school is cool now. They weren't even cool then. It was an illusion, a magic trick. So now where are we? 
That's my point. Church, where are we, church? In your hive mind collective, where are we? In your gag order not to talk about uh, whatever, where are we? Was that worth it? Was cutting yourself away from God worth joining the church over? Okay, I must return to sleep. I really sincerely hope that all of you get all this squared away, you know, and then I do. Pray for me for strength and I pray for you for good success. I know that you, you, you will die not in vain. Can we live not in vain too, though? That's what I want to do. I mean, can we, can we do that? Can we actually live, you know, courageously rather than just getting through? Can we? And the answer is, well, only with the power of the Lord, which I guess we have to wear on our sleeve, and that will make us more courageous. But, I mean, on our own, no, we can't, you know. He has to be completely involved with us so that we speak as we ought to speak, boldly. To, to quote the apostle, boldly. Can we live with our heads up, though they mock and laugh and point? Can we look upon them with compassion because we know that what was to befall them is so horrifying? And we know that we are already spoken for. So there's no need for us to enter into a contest with them. Rather, to see them as souls on their way to death and to failure. And to have mercy upon them. Amen. Okay. Where are we here? <laughs> the the lines are blurred between it would seem, ladies and gentlemen, between the dream state that I'm just about in and reality and this whole blur, this whole being taken back to this party. And then oh my god, you know. Was there anything sacred? Was there, was there anything that wasn't this? The answer is no, everything is this. Well then, what say you about the Super Bowl? We have Lady Gaga doing the national anthem, which to me is the abomination of desolation. There it is. You needn't look any further. And then what do we have? We got Coldplay, Beyonce, whatever. I, I, you know, I don't know. I'll be looking for eyes to turn black. I always like it. It seems that the Super Bowl has more demonic activity than anything else all year long. This is number 50, so it's an important date. Will they launch a mass execution of people there? I kind of doubt it because that's sort of obvious, but could there be something else related to it? Sure there could. But whatever happens, it's all scripted and it's all theater, is it not? Whether it's ISIS or whether it's this or that, whether it's this war, that war, it's all scripted. It's all, it's all um, suspect. It's all really more about this other thing than what it claims to be about. So the Super Bowl is really about indoctrination. It's really the biggest event of the year in a way for that particular thing, more so than any other event that I can think of. That's why all the, the commercials are, are so infused with demonic signatures and meanings and different things because they're, that's how they, do, they indoctrinate people or get them started. They open up a portal in you, you know what I mean? And they kind of inject you with something. And then you, you know, you, you, you either part of it or you're not. But if you are, then you, 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 you all the more go with them, you know. And them is not them. Them is death. 
It's almost like a, ma- a mass suicide spell. It's almost like Jonestown, you know. You're, you're right, even though you're not going to die right away, you know, physically. It's, it's an inducement. I was hearing how on Fox News they were so enamored with Beyonce. They oh, I could have Beyonce all day, but Coldplay, oh, they're terrible. And I was just thinking just the opposite. But, you know, I'm, or I don't care about either one of them. Well, when Beyonce did her thing, it was for 2012 when her eyes turned black and stuff, I was like, you know, but if you ever do anything that's like, you know, besides all this tough dancing and trying to be this tough girl, if you do anything of significance, I'll be, t- you know, I'm quick to forgive. I mean, I, it's not really forgiving. It's just I'm, if it's something that would mean something to me in any way, shape, or form, or if there are lyrics there that are above, above Oh Baby Baby or whatever, um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to listen. Or be above, you know, politically correct pressure which is what Gaga is, is kind of all about, right? It's, it's, you know, she's Miss PC, Miss, Miss Piggy, Miss PC, whatever. That's her role is to really enforce, 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 enforce. Guilt, shame, suffering, whatever. Um, and because of that, you know, they let her run around, you know, as Cinderella. You know, as if she's free doing her own thing. <laughs> that couldn't be farther from the truth. I would contend, ladies and gentlemen, that every single thing that that person writes and everything they do is pre-scripted. Oh, they're writing it all right. It's them, they're there doing it and going through in their head and saying, ah, let me try this line, let me try this verse. But it, unbeknownst to them, it's completely... It may be that with all of us to a certain extent, you know? It, 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 um, you're going to come from your position, right? And you're going to write from there. But the position she's coming from is indoctrination and control, social control and social conformity and uh, political correctness. Am I right or am I wrong? Of course I'm right. To enforce the values that are, that are in enforcement now, the current values, right? Yes? Uh, equality, not, you know, the, you know the, the gay thing, no prejudice against that, you know, the, the race thing, you know, all these little memes that they have going, it's enforcing all that, right? So that would be informing all the writing, correct? That's all I meant. Before you think it's someone who's got her hand strapped down and she's being forced to write lyrics, like uh, being forced to put certain notes in there. It's, it's really, when you're a willing vessel, it's really just kind of going with the flow. But uh, she's made it incredibly clear to me what side of this equation she's on. Thus and therefore, the things coming from that spiritual realm through her would be the things that I would expect that would promote social conformity, uh, the PC um, totalitarianism, and a willingness to... uh, Let them have you so that you can be non-judgmental and cool. If she decides that's not what she wants to do and she'd rather do instead of this one trick pony something else over here, then I'm sure it would be very hard to find her. Uh, it's okay, but having her sing the national anthem, knowing what's going on, I think that's something I would, I, I think that, that just right now, I can tell you, because I'm in the future right now, that's a, it's horrifying, it's almost like so diabolical, it's genius, it's like Obama praising Jesus, it's on that level, or Obama praising the United States of America. Obama saying, God bless the United States of America. It's on that level. Right? It's, a, right? It's, it's the ultimate. It's the penultimate. 
<laughs> God bless you, each and every one. Out. I know. Well, I say each and every one because I. Well, I'm okay. God convict you if you're a, a Satanist or a witch or whatever. You try to tune in to figure out what the enemy's up to. I'm not the enemy. I'm the messenger. I try to explain this to people, but they think I'm doing it. And, you know, it may be me, but it's also, you know, but it's, it's just like them on the other side. They're, they're kind of like lock, stock, and barrel, so am I, you know. So what comes from me is going to be this side of things. Inform that way. Well, I don't know. I, look, I hope a generation isn't sacrificed. I don't, you know, that's just, I, I don't like to think about awful things like that. You know, like, like, well, a generation will be sacrificed because of the fact that it's a rebuke to the, um, to, to, to the status quo that, you know, you're lost, adrift, whatever. But, I mean, stranger things have happened throughout history. I think we are to be very arrogant to think that God doesn't punish God doesn't repay. Well, what are they all involved in? What is our society involved in more than anything else? What I just said about the party, the scalping of souls for Satan, right? I mean, that's basically the, the industry upon the earth. That's what all the music is and the yelling and the screaming and all the you know, programs and all the education and everything. It's all kind of leading to that, right? To that nexus point, to that right rendering human as kind of a commodity. Okay, a container, yes? We're containers. And they want what's contained out of there and in their possession. Not the humans, but who the humans have worked for, the Nazis, let's say, in Auschwitz. You know, their deal is they just want a better cut. So, you know, they get a better cut in exchange for their obedience to the side that's anti-human. And that's what I believe is, that's the elephant in the room, and I think that's the, that's the big, the, 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 this is the ontological and existential problem that we face upon the earth, that unless addressed, which can only be addressed in the spiritual realm because it's a spiritual battle that gets people to consent or not consent. If you lose the spiritual battle, obviously then they got you. Well, if it wasn't for God, they would have had me a million times over. So it's no virtue. You know, no one's claiming, well, I'm, I'm, I'm John Wayne, so they can get me. No. If I'm not gotten, it's because God preserved me. You know, and who am I speaking to right now? I'm trying to encourage people to do their best. Oh, many times I've thought about just giving up and, and letting them have their way with me and just being obedient and, you know, just, you know, st stopping with this any kind of resistance. Yes, I have oftentimes wanted to do that. And then something in me just rebels against that idea. And it's sometimes back and forth and back and forth. It's a real struggle. That's what I mean. I'm not really fit to lead because I got my own. I'm embattled myself, within myself. You know, I think I'm able to describe it Whatever I'm able to do communication-wise, it's <clears throat> all because of whatever made me me, you know? But I'll be the last one to tell you that I've won. I just got to keep being vigilant. I mean, you know, this every day I'm noticing that, you know, the, the you know, and as I get closer to death, too, you know, it's like, it's like they just want me to go ahead and go with that, too. Not rail against it, you know, with every ounce of life I've got. Just go ahead and sink into old age and death. Just go ahead and let them have you. You know what I mean? That go ahead and take it easy. Go ahead and just, you know what I mean? And just let them make you into an abomination first so that they can laugh at you or make you, you know, give you, you know, whatever. Well, they've, they've loved to have people laughing at me throughout my life. They've... They've enjoyed humiliating me. And they say, if you, you know, and, and, and I'm very well aware that if I, if I cooperate with them, they would still humiliate me. There, there is no place for me there. I know that. But still there's this seduction that goes on to just, you know, go the easy way. 
that even if you don't get treated the same way the the, the rock stars get treated, at least the, the you know they'll 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 quit picking on you for a while. Like that's not so bad. The 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 mocking and laughing and pointing and all that I don't care about that anymore either. That used to bother me. Well, I didn't know what I did wrong, so I I never that that was the traumatizing thing, not knowing what you're on, you know what you're being laughed at for. What did you do or what did you say or, you know? And it's a, it's they're laughing at you because of your position and all this because you're not there where they are. They think that, that their thing is the bomb and that anyone that doesn't get it is 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 absolutely mockable and laughable and pathetic and ridiculous and there to be made into a laughing stock or, a, you know, some kind of um, um, object of ridicule. You know, for no other reason, just to show people what happens if you, uh, you know, if you screw up with this, you know, you could wind up being like that. I mean, you don't want to be like that, do you? So do what you're told and follow the rules. Don't question too much. There's actually music in the rock in, the, in those eras, in, the, in that era, that, that tells you don't question too much. I had heard that the CIA pulled all the LSD and all that, or the, and the powers that be, let's just put it that way, because it made people think too much. So they really pushed the marijuana, because that kind of goes the other way, if people don't think too much. And, um, but even that they don't want to push. So they push drugs, you know, illicit drugs that will make people um, want the drug, you know, and everything, and want to obey, you know, something that rather than something that makes you think, especially outside the box, think, you know, if, ever figure out what this thing is. Because if you did, you know, your, your life would change. I mean, it would obviously be, this is what it is? Oh, my God. You know, and then you look back through your life, you see the entire, your entire life is completely irrelevant as to what you thought it was. It, it's, it's, it's a non-starter. If you're just there, so they can, they're, they're trying to get you, you see, that's all there is. And then when they got you, they try to recruit, recruit you into being someone who helps them get more. It's just like a big fat tick sucking up all the blood. And then finally it can't suck anymore up, it explodes. And that's kind of where, you know, where things are right now at the exploding. Uh, well, I think people thought that they had finally found a way to go. And now they're so unsuccessful and so bankrupt and so impoverished that they're screaming, Bernie, help us, you know, tax those rich people, give us money. And there won't be any rich people to tax. Ultimately, the poor are going to get poorer. Communism, socialism, all that makes the people poor and, and downtrodden. It's like witchcraft. I've tried to explain it, but people don't listen. You need an economic engine to create revenue for you know, roads and bridges. and uh, you know, Maybe there could be free education, free everything. I, you know, but you need, <laughs> if you want that, you still need an economic engine. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't like economic engines. He can't tell you. As far as Bernie Sanders is concerned, the stork brings the money. Or the money just grows on trees. And that's why I've, I just laugh with these people. But I realize so many people are so stupid in this country that they would not think about economics. They would just think about, you know, taking a shortcut. Because that's, after all, that's all they've done their whole life anyway, taking a shortcut. In fact, I would contend, ladies and gentlemen, last thing I'm going to say, that I'm really going to go, that these people who, who would be trying to get this shortcut, you know, constantly, you know, what are you going to do for me? You know, how can I get, I get my student loan, you know, whatever. Uh, without thinking about where's the money come from and what, you know, anything deeper than that. I would say they're a product of the educational system, but, but more than that, they're a product of the beast system. You know, completely dumbed down, completely vapid, you know, airhead, whatever, just, just stupid as all get out. And just like a hive mind, you know, whatever the group says, you know, they just do. Group think, group mind, group control. And, you know, invasion of the body snatchers was the best allegory because it just basically says once you're conformed to the system like that, your job is to go out and find others who are not 
until you get them all. And then the whole thing breaks, and then that's the end of it. Then they start the game all over again. I just wonder if anybody knows that. And it's as typical, all you people listening in here, therefore, you all know this already. But the people out there, I guess they know it on some level, but because they're participating in it, being that they're on the wrong side, they feel guilty at some part of their being for being a traitor, right? Uh, but because there's so many of them, they feel like it's okay. Not realizing that the piper is going to have to be paid one of these days. Just like when I went back and I walked through this little mansion in Hancock Park with this party because mom and dad just happened to be gone that weekend. And then I saw all of it, all the structure. Oh, my God. How could I have been such a fool thinking things were free? Free love, free drugs, hanging out. I don't advocate drugs at all to anybody. The drugs are another snare like... Anything else is bondage. They offered me pain pills. Um, when I had a cyst removed in my back, I, I wouldn't take them. Don't want it. Because I know what it leads to. Because I know, it, I know it's, 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 I don't need it. I'm not going to take it, you know? All right. See you next time. I love you. I'm praying for you. And, well, I pray right now, Lord, in Jesus' name, I... I pray that the people having a tough time who are listening and I pray the Lord just takes that tough time off you right now and gives you a perspective so you can just laugh at, you know and I pray for me too that I have that you know because it doesn't matter all the opportunities you have or all the blessings you have if you can't laugh if you're beleaguered if you're if you're inundated if you you feel it's you feel that terrible dread in your in your bones and in your soul then you know Despite all the blessings you have, they're no good because you're vexed. And I pray for that vexation to be taken off of you and off of me because no one should have to be feeling that every day. And in Jesus' name, I bid you shalom.